I'm going to tell you a story today about hatred of women on the internet. The near completion of a very interesting and probably very important case is happening. Last summer, misogynists were engaged in a virulent hate campaign against Anita Sarkeesian. I found myself the target of a massive online hate campaign. And worst of all, one man in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. There was even a game made where players were invited to beat the bitch out. A better word. Anyway, these two women, Ms. Guthrie and another, um, say that uh, Mr. Elliott was criminally harassing them. Right? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I'm also talking about a lack of social consequences, like maybe facing a torrent of criticism for your garbage behavior. In fact, though, the investigating officer who charged Mr. Elliott has acknowledged in his testimony that um, Mr. Elliott never threatened either of these women. And other bigots never have to face their critics because their critics are encouraged to shut up. Women, he never used any sexual innuendo. He didn't do anything that you would typically associate with uh, harassing behavior, and I guess... The Not only does this mean that they can continue their behavior with impunity, but it gives them the impression that their views are popular. I actually raised 25 times what I initially asked for. Mr. Elliott's already paid a pretty severe uh, penalty. Basically, what he did was disagree politically with these young women. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a departure from my usual thing. I usually do uh, kind of big broad videos about overarching social themes and legal matters. Um, this video is going to be looking into a specific case, um, an extremely important case uh, in that is before the Canadian criminal courts right now. And uh, that would be the case of, uh, it's known as the Twitter harassment case, and it's the complaint by Stephanie Guthrie, a prominent Toronto feminist, um, and a colleague of hers named Heather Riley, um, a charge of criminal harassment against a graphic designer by the name of Gregory Allen Elliott. And I think that this is an extremely, uh, th this case is so important, um, much more important than I think anyone in mainstream media seems to think, uh, simply due to the ramifications on freedom of expression, particularly in the context of political discourse, that could result from a guilty finding, from a conviction. So. I'm going to try to parse this uh, for those of you who may not have heard of it and for those of you who have maybe only read a little bit about it, I'm going to try and parse the entire thing from beginning to end. Now, last week I spent about two days, yes, two days poring over the defense's closing arguments in this case, in the Twitter harassment case. Um, one that, I, as I have said, has enormous implications for freedom of expression within Canadian political discourse. Um, the case has been dubbed by mainstream media as the Twitter harassment case, and on the surface, if you go by the majority of mainstream coverage, that's exactly what it is. It's sort of a case of one person committing misogynistic internet harassment against um, a woman or a group of women. Now, the case centers around the complaints of two Toronto feminists, Stephanie Guthrie and Heather Riley, their online followers, and a Toronto-based graphic artist named Gregory Allen Elliott. But the real beginning of this story revolves around two completely different people, a well-known feminist pop culture critic named Anita Sarkeesian, and a, at that point, unknown young man by the name of Bendelin Spur. Now, it was in 2012 that Sarkeesian decided to take her particular brand of feminist pop culture critique out of the passé realms of TV ads and movies and popular songs and into the multi-billion dollar industry of AAA video games. She began with a modest Kickstarter requesting $6,000 in funding to help her research and create a multi-part series of videos analyzing sexist stereotypes and misogynistic tropes in video games. 
Now, what she received was a lot of pushback from video game consumers on her YouTube Kickstarter video, and about 26 times as much money as she had initially asked for. Now, the astute observer might surmise, just looking at what was going on, that her seemingly sudden about face regarding comment, ma comment management might have something to do with her massive earnings on her fundraiser. I mean, here she was a person who has repeatedly stated that she sets comments to approval in order to maintain a safe space for feminist discussion, closing off the comments in every single venue she had any control over while simultaneously allowing unlimited commenting on her Kickstarter video on YouTube. This had the effect of driving any and all commentary and criticism against her to one place, the place where the donate button was. And the internet denizens, who had up until that point been completely prevented from criticizing her ideas and her work for months or years, well, they showed up in that one place, the place with the donate button. If you open the space, the trolls will come. And the donations followed. And it turns out that quite a few people are actually interested in a project that would deconstruct the representations of women in games. And who are totally outraged at the harassment that too often plagues our gaming communities. I actually raised 25 times what I initially asked for. Well played, Miss Sarkeesian. Now, over the course of the next several months, Sarkeesian's focus would transform considerably away from any critical feminist analysis of video games and other entertainment media and toward a more lucrative and overarching thesis regarding the allegedly rampant harassment and intimidation of women in general and feminists in particular over the internet. Project goals and milestones set out in her fundraiser were set aside, deprioritized in favor of capitalizing on the buzz surrounding the cyber mob of misogynistic trolls she has consistently portrayed as determined to terrorize feminist women like her off of the internet and out of the discussion. In her TEDx talk on the subject, she would portray these trolls as a highly organized mob, assembled, indoctrinated, and whipped into a frenzy on forums like 4chan, and then unleashed in a merciless, methodical, multi-pronged campaign of harassment and intimidation against her. Her portrayal of this organized cyber mob turned her into a cause célèbre in progressive media, a fulcrum around which hot-button issues among progressives and social justice warriors and the mainstream media could center themselves. And there, amid her examples of this highly organized cyber mob and this coordinated, systematic effort to bully her out of this discussion, well, there appeared a shoddy but fateful flash-based game app unironically titled Beat Up Anita Sarkeesian, slapped together on a whim by then comparably unknown Bendelin Spur. Now, this was not Spur's first foray into the world of crappy flash games. He'd constructed an identical game about six years before for an identical reason, targeting the person making identical, unsupported claims about the effects of video games on real-life behavior. That person was Jack Thompson, who between 23 and 2005 had filed several amicus briefs and lawsuits aimed at addressing what he saw as a link between violent video game consumption and extreme forms of youth violence such as school shootings. To date, there is no peer-reviewed empirical data linking consumption of violent video games and the perpetration of real-life violence. In fact, what little correlation exists is inverse. That is, the generation most likely to have grown up playing Doom, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, or Grand Theft Auto is the least violent generation in recorded history. And somehow, the entire video game industry, from creators to consumers, saw through Thompson's bogus claims. And Ben Spur, at that time a teenager, an avid game fan, and a fan art dabbler, created a simplistic and silly flash game called Beat Up Jack Thompson. 
And no one in the video game industry, from creators to consumers, had any fucks to give about how Spurs' beat-up Jack Thompson game promoted violence against an identified person. They were too busy hacking Thompson's image into ultraviolent video games so that players could rip out his spine, or toss him into a giant set of gears and watch his pulped muscle and bone splatter on the walls. And let's keep in mind that the theses embraced by these two pop culture critics uh, were identical. In Jack Thompson's case, he described violent video games as murder simulators, desensitizing players against the real-life fallout and horror of violence, and training them to kill. In Sarkeesian's case, she describes misogynistic tropes and violence against women in video games essentially as misogyny simulators, perpetuating and reinforcing real-life misogyny and promoting real-life violence against women. Neither critic was an insider in the industry. That is, they were neither creators nor considered themselves gamers, and neither had an empirical leg to stand on. But one of them was a middle-aged right-wing Christian man, and the other was an attractive progressive feminist woman. And that apparently made all the difference in the world. It was with his creation of the Beat Up Anita Sarkeesian video game that Ben Spur, an unknown schmuck who cooks pasta and steaks for a living and spent his off hours devouring video games and posting the odd fan art sketch on DeviantArt, became the devil. Like he did with the Jack Thompson game app, he created his Anita Sarkeesian app under his real name. He didn't make it difficult for people to find it or him. In his mind, and in the mind of anyone with a modicum of common sense and moral consistency, he'd done nothing wrong. If beat up Jack, Jack Thompson was totally okay, then beat up Anita Sarkeesian should be no less okay. Particularly since he included a text preamble to the beat up Anita Sarkeesian game explaining his reasons for making it, something he had felt no need whatsoever to do regarding his Jack Thompson game. That is, before arriving at the game's playable portion, players had to scroll through this. Who is Anita Sarkeesian? Anita Sarkeesian is a con artist who poses as a feminist on YouTube with her biased show, Feminist Frequency. Recently, she claimed she needed $6,000 in order to start a mini video series on sexism towards women in video games. These videos would require no more money to produce to produce or any more research than she's put into any of her previous YouTube videos. She just decided that the ad revenue from YouTube wasn't enough to line her pockets. She raised over $160,000. So far, her videos have proven to have no research put into them whatsoever. She has effectively conned thousands of people. There is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting equality for women. The problem is people like Anita are only selfishly looking out for their own benefits. They want all the perks that everyone else earns without any of the work or risk involved. Anita Sarkeesian is a person who is scammed thousands of people who simply do not know any better because she knows they do not know any better. Nothing she has done or ever will do will benefit anyone but herself. She has refused to address any form of criticism whatsoever and hides behind the fact that she has a vagina claiming it's sexist to criticize her in any way. She claims to want equality. Well, here it is. There's been a disgusting large imbalance of men who get beaten up in games. Let's add a lady to help balance things. When Ben Spur made this game, he had eight followers on Twitter and had only ever made six tweets. He was an unknown, working in a restaurant in Northern Ontario, someone with few resources and zero influence online or politically. I think feminists would call this an unequal power relationship. At least they would if Spur was a woman and Sarkeesian was a man. Now, to expand on this idea a little, I'm going to use the definition uh, from one of the first links Google vomited at me when I fed in the term unequal power relationship, which seems to be a website promoting socially responsible consumption. That is, promoting the idea of purchasing products you can verify were produced through ethical and socially responsible means. Quote, An unequal power relationship is the basic component of a power structure. 
the person with superior power, either due to trust or to technology access or superior knowledge, does not necessarily have superior ethical judgment just because they are trusted, technologically enabled, or better educated. Very often, such a position is an open door to abuses to which the lesser powered have no recourse." End quote. And oh my goodness, does this concept ever apply in the case of Ben Spur, a working class nobody with eight Twitter followers and a crappy game I could probably put together myself without any help, despite my entire lack of know-how, versus Anita Sarkeesian, a trusted media darling with 160 grand in her pocket, a history with communications and PR, and a massive following who was at that time being flown to paid speaking engagements as far away as Sweden. The moment the game was publicized, the entirety of the mainstream came down on it and its creator. Sarkeesian, rather than acknowledging the power imbalance between her and a man like Spur, spoke publicly of his game in the broader context of an organized cyber mob, for whose existence there is little evidence and of which Spur, regardless, has never been a member. Alone, Spur was just a guy with no power as part of a highly organized and regimented group perpetrating systematic, methodical, and concerted campaigns of terror against her, he could be elevated in the minds of observers to the status of powerful, formidable, misogynist bully. His association with the cyber mob, as dubious as it was, transformed him in the eyes of the mainstream into a looming monster capable of silencing women through intimidation. And of course, his game was removed from any and all websites that had hosted it. Articles were written calling it out for its promotion of misogyny and violence against women, few to none of them mentioning in any way his preamble and his stated reasons for creating the game. It became yet another example of how much society, and men in particular, arbitrarily hate outspoken women just because they're women. And Stephanie Guthrie, a politically connected Toronto feminist and avid supporter of Sarkeesian, and the founder of a non-profit organization called Women in Toronto Politics, she went digging. In short order, she discovered who Ben Spur was, what social and media accounts he used, and where he lived. And overnight, Ben Spur, who had eight followers and had made all of six tweets at that point, woke up to hundreds of Twitter notifications. Hundreds of tweets directed at him, condemning him, mocking him, accusing him of all manner of awful things, and even threatening him with harm or death. And where did these tweets come from? Well, from an organized cyber mob. Steph Guthrie herself explains it in a TEDx talk. So how were we able to confront this man through means that might not have been available offline? Well. Remember how the performative nature of online behavior encourages new expressions of the same old misogyny? Well, online performance can also challenge that behavior. By confronting Bendelin in a public forum like Twitter, rather than, say, emailing him, I was demonstrating or performing the type of way that I thought would be good to challenge him. And my performance, like his game, was interactive. I invited audience members, if you will, to leap out of their seats and get on stage. Now, I couldn't control what they did once they got there. But I... See, bigotry can be elusive to bigots themselves. Bendelin Spur had convinced himself that creating a video game simulating the brutalization of a feminist he disagreed with was not misogynist. Not only did Guthrie sick the internet on Ben Spur, she contacted his employer and any potential employer she could find to inform them of his wicked misogynistic beliefs and actions. In an email interview, Spur confirmed that not only was he harassed on social media and not only was his employer contacted, but certain individuals had dug up the phone numbers of people personally close to him in order to engage in what he describes as continuous heckling. These individuals uh, are so concerned about becoming targets once again 
that they declined to give even anonymous statements about their experiences for this video series. These people are afraid. Now, to my knowledge, there exists no TEDx talk wherein some denizen of 4chan relays his decision to sick the internet on Anita Sarkeesian, let alone one where such person, person attempts and succeeds in justifying it to the audience. Yet here we have an example of an actual cyber mob organized around a specific influential individual who has assumed a leadership role aimed at destroying the life and reputation of someone with no power to speak of who created a piece of media she disapproves of. And her bullying tactics are not only tolerated but applauded by the mainstream because they reinforce the narrative that men are powerful oppressors and women are their hapless helpless victims. That any instance of a man criticizing a woman is automatically punching down, while any instance of a woman attacking a man, no matter how brutally and no matter how imbalanced the power relationship is, is self-defense or combating oppression. Quelle surprise. Now, my next planned video is going to take up where we left off here, and I will follow the travails of another man who dared to speak his mind and disagree with a feminist on the internet. And it will explore some of the many potential implications of a poor judicial decision in this mostly ignored um, criminal case. Until then, see you later. My name is Whitney Phillips, and for the last five years, I have studied and written about trolls. Last night, my initial post of the confrontation with Bendel and Spur had been shared nearly 30,000 times. Trolls and the trolls who troll them. Over the years, I've encountered a number of difficult questions about my research. What else is there to say other than they're bad guys? Bendel and Spur had convinced himself that creating a video game simulating the brutalization of a feminist he disagreed with was not misogynist. We'll make a case for the cultural significance of villains, scoundrels, and rule breakers more broadly understood. What transgression also does, and which is more frequently overlooked, is provide a window onto the norm, at least what passes as the norm, within a particular culture or community. The idea that transgression sheds light on the larger culture harkens to anthropologist Mary Douglas's seminal study of culturally specific taboo, particularly those centering on notions of dirt and dirtiness. I actually raised 25 times what I initially asked for. Matter out of place is only intelligible in the context of existing systems of cleanliness. Put simply, you can't really think of something as being dirty if you don't already have a basic sense of what qualifies as clean. Similarly, cultural aberration is only intelligible in the context of existing social systems. By analyzing that which is regarded as transgressive then, one is able to reconstruct the cultural value systems out of which the behaviors emerge and against which the behaviors transgress. Distilled down, this idea can be understood thus. Figure out who and what freaks a, a particular group out, and you are on your way towards understanding what makes that group tick. Mr. Elliott's already paid a pretty severe uh, penalty. Basically, what he did was disagree politically with these young women.